Welcome to Enigma Files. Did you know, over 50 years later, humanity is gearing up to land on the moon again. But what's really going on behind the scenes? Is it just a nostalgic trip down memory lane, or is there something much bigger at play? From technological advances to global competition, from lunar resources to military strategy, the truth behind NASA's Artemis program might just blow your mind. Today, we're peeling back the mystery and diving into this upcoming space adventure. Let's uncover the stories and challenges that you probably never knew about. All right, let's talk about the Artemis program today. On November 16, 2022, NASA launched a manned spacecraft to the moon's orbit. The spacecraft is called Orion, and it's very similar to the Apollo spacecraft, but 2.5 times bigger. It can carry more cargo and people. The Apollo spacecraft could only carry three people, while Orion can carry six people and more cargo. But this time, the Orion spacecraft wasn't carrying any people. It was sent up empty for testing to see if it could safely orbit the moon. The mission was called Artemis 1. The rocket used to launch it is called the SLS, which is a bit smaller than the Apollo rockets. Now, many people might not know this, but the rocket is mostly made up of the propulsion system, with just the very tip, the small triangular part, being the actual spacecraft. The biggest part is a first stage rocket booster, followed by a second stage booster, and two small side boosters that drop off after two minutes of flight. After about eight minutes, the first stage rocket detaches. The second stage booster detaches after two hours. What's left is just the white spacecraft part, which has solar panels folded up and once deployed, it uses solar energy to head toward the moon. For days after launch, the spacecraft reached the moon's orbit, where it orbited the moon for two days, and then, using its power, it left the moon's orbit and headed back to Earth. On the way back, it jettisoned the solar panels and only the small, human-capable section of the spacecraft made the return journey. So out of the entire 100-meter-long rocket, only the last two to three meters came back to Earth. After this test flight, NASA's plan is to launch Artemis II in 2026, which will carry astronauts to orbit the moon again, this time with people on board, but they won't land. Then about a year, in 2027, they'll launch Artemis III with the goal of landing humans on the moon once again. It's been 50 years since the last moon landing, so of course, NASA needs to test new landing technologies. They're being extra careful because many of the people who organized the first moon landings are no longer around, and some of the technology from back then has supposedly been destroyed. Why? Who knows? If all goes well, in just a couple of years, we might witness humans stepping on the moon again. I'm guessing if there's a live stream, we'll probably get over 3 billion viewers. And speaking of Artemis 1, NASA released an interior photo of the spacecraft, and guess what? There are no real people on board, just mannequins. Inside the Artemis capsule, there are actually three mannequins, but only one is visible in the photo. And here's the twist, one of them is dressed as Snoopy. Why? To honor Apollo 10's lunar module, which was also named Snoopy. So, 50 years later, Snoopy is back, flying in space and testing out new tech for the upcoming moon mission. Talk about a space comeback. Now, before we get into Artemis, let's rewind to the first time humans landed on the moon, July 20th, 1969. Apollo 11, with Neil Armstrong at the helm, made history. Armstrong was the first to step onto the lunar surface while Buzz Aldrin, the second man on the moon, followed right behind. Fun fact, Buzz Lightyear from Toy Story was named after Aldrin. Cool, huh? Aldrin may not have been first to step on the moon, but he was the first to return to Earth from another planet. When Apollo 11 came back, Aldrin landed first. So, if you ask him, he might say he's the first person to come back from the moon. Friendly competition, anyone? But here's the thing, humans didn't just land once. There were six Apollo missions in total. Apollo 13? Not so much. Twelve astronauts walked on the moon, and the last man to do so was from Apollo 17, back in December 1972. Since then? Well, no one's been back. So, why haven't we returned? Some people still question whether the moon landings were real. This theory popped up just two years after Apollo 17, fueled by the intense U.S.-Soviet space race. The U.S. went from barely orbiting to landing on the moon, and some wondered if it was all just a Hollywood stunt. Fast forward to today, and satellites orbiting the moon have snapped clear photos of Apollo's landing sites, rovers, and equipment. So, is the moon landing real? It sure looks like it. But if the evidence is there, why not go back to check those old spots? 
Maybe it's just more fun to explore new areas. Who knows? It's funny though, right? With all these high-tech satellites, the only thing they seem to capture clearly is the moon. Everything else, a bit blurry. Almost like the camera knows exactly what to focus on. Maybe it's all part of the program. So, why hasn't the U.S. returned to the moon? Simple, it's just too expensive. The Apollo program costs about $120 billion dollars or a trillion dollars today. And the US government is already running a hefty deficit. But here's the twist. NASA admits the cost of moon missions has dropped significantly. Today, sending a mission to the moon would cost about $100 billion, just one-sixth of what it used to. But the real reason? There's no competition. When the US landed on the moon, it was a flex on the Soviets, showing who was boss in the space race. And since then, no one else has landed. So, why go back? Well, now there's a new challenger, China. Let's take a look at their space advancements. In 2003, China launched its first astronaut, Yang Liwei, into space aboard Shenzhou 5. Just two years later, they had a two-person crew on Shenzhou 6 for a five-day mission. By 2007, China launched Chang'e 1, its first lunar orbiter, and in 2008, astronaut Jai Jigang made China's first spacewalk. Talk about moving fast. In 2013, Chang'e 3 made history as the first soft moon landing since 1976. Then in 2019, Chang'e 4 became the first mission to land on the far side of the moon. No one had done that before, but China didn't stop there. In 2020, they brought back moon samples with Chang'e 5. Now they're working on lunar bases, Mars missions, and more. It's clear. After 50 years of the U.S. holding the moon title, China's making waves in space. Does the U.S. feel threatened? Absolutely. They're still reeling from China's rapid progress, even though they landed on the moon half a century ago. Enter the Artemis program, which aims to return to the moon and build a permanent base. Why? Because whoever gets to the moon first gets to call the shots. And the U.S. has bigger plans. A manned mission to Mars to turn it into Earth's second home. Why Artemis? It's named after Apollo's twin sister, Artemis, the Greek goddess of the moon. So the U.S. is basically saying, the moon's ours, hands off. But here's the twist. To make this happen, the U.S. needs money. A lot of money. So they're teaming up with private companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin. It's like the internet all over again. The military developed it, then privatized it, and boom, look at where we are now. And space? Well, it's got big money potential. First up, internet. There are still remote places without it, but satellites could solve that problem. Whoever controls space-based internet controls the future of the web. Enter Elon Musk Starlink, with over 3,500 satellites already in orbit and a goal of 42,000. And he's not alone. Jeff Bezos' project Hyper plans to launch 3,000 satellites, and Masayoshi Sun's OneWeb had big plans too, though they hit a rough patch. But it's not just about the internet. There's a whole new frontier, transportation. Imagine getting from one side of the Earth to the other in just 30 minutes. Rocket power flights. No more 30-hour flights, just 30 minutes to anywhere. Pretty wild, right? And don't worry if this seems like a distant dream. In just a few years, it could be a reality for the super-rich. In 10 to 15 years, it could be for everyone. Communication and logistics will be the big moneymakers. But there's also tourism. Space tourism is already happening. In 2020, Bezos and his crew, including an 82-year-old astronaut and an 18-year-old high schooler, went up in Blue Origin. Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic did the same with their own space tourists. Sure, it's more like an amusement park ride right now. But in the future, space hotels, zero-gravity bathrooms, and meals with a view of Earth, the moon, and the sun. The possibilities are endless. Space tourism could even take us beyond Earth. Imagine taking a trip to the moon, first lunar flybys, then landings. By 2050, you might be standing on the moon, though you'll be 70 years later than Neil Armstrong. But hey, it'll still be pretty epic, right? And the cherry on top? Billionaire Yusaku Maizawa is planning to orbit the moon in 2023 with a group of eight. It's basically a publicity stunt, but it's also a big investment in the space tourism industry. This is the age of space exploration. Just like the age of exploration centuries ago, we're heading into uncharted territory.
space tour guides, hotels, concerts, amusement parks, all on the horizon. And of course, we need spaceports. Just like airports and seaports, we'll need places to launch rockets. The U.S. already has 12 spaceport projects in the works, and Japan's building one too. Why remote? Because rockets need to fly eastward over the ocean, not over cities. So, in a few decades, space travel could become as normal as flying. And who knows, maybe you'll even open a shop on the moon. Space entrepreneurs, get ready. The future is closer than you think. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe.